Well, folks, as you can see, it's that spooky month where pumpkins start showing up on our porches and we start asking ourselves what we're thankful for as Americans. Well, I won't get into that, but as a YouTuber, I'm <laughs> thankful that over 60,000 of you have liked my stuff enough to think that you want to see more of it for long enough to press that big red button and forget to go back and fix it. 60,000 is an odd number. I'd intended to do something at 50,000, but when that number was reached, I was working as hard as I have in my life to move into my new studio space, and my girlfriend was prepping for a multi-month trip to deal with family business. So things were such utter chaos, I didn't even notice it happened until another 10,000 plus people had subscribed. So while I was thinking about waiting and doing a 69,000 subscriber special, because it would be nice, I'm already long overdue, so here we are. I wanted to do something to show my gratitude to everyone who has stuck around and, and kept enjoying my creative output. Couldn't think of anything though, so we're doing a Q&A. This is partly because I have not been keeping up with comments as much as I used to. I used to try to reply to everyone, well, who wasn't being a dick, uh, but the number of comments I'm getting nowadays is ridiculous and I can't begin to keep up with them. Part of the problem is I get a lot of redundant comments, which I can't blame anybody for. I can't ask you to go read through every single of 1,500 comments before posting a question, uh, but from my perspective, I just don't have the energy to reply to the same question over and over and over, so usually the first person who asks gets an answer, and then everybody after that, sorry. But of course, I'm also getting a proportionally higher number of actual assholes. On every video I post now, one person calls me fat. Trust me, bud. I know I'm fat. You're not bringing anything new to the table. I also bet that I make a lot more off the way I look than you do off the way you look. So if you want to put a couple pounds on, feel free to eat me. That's not really very common though. Most people are really, really nice. I just don't have the time and energy to respond to everyone. So I wanted to put some time aside to respond to everyone who wanted to ask me a question. So here we are. I have 85 of your finest questions here. Um, I pared down a few, apologies if yours didn't make the cut. It's either because I felt it was a duplicate or I didn't know how to answer it. Also, in the middle of this, I'll be doing a small tour of the studio. Um, I had already posted some videos on Patreon, but at this point, it's probably something I should share with everybody. I just wanted to wait until the place was a little more squared away and set up the way I wanted it to be, which of course has not and will not ever happen. So let's cut to the chase. So with almost no further ado, uh, here are some questions. I didn't script this, by the way. Um, I did run through this yesterday, uh, did the whole video. It took me about six hours. And when I got home and looked at the footage, I realized I looked like a horrible golem because of the way I lit it. So this is only more or less off the cuff. Dylan McGrory asks, uh, you've done a lot with older professional VHS equipment and I've heard HD television cameras from the late 2000s aren't too ridiculously expensive due to 4K filming standards. Uh, any possible plans? This is similar to a question that I get not infrequently where people say like, hey, uh, what if you did a whole video or a, you know, a live show or something like that just using these old cameras? Well, the problem with them is that they suck. Even the early HD stuff is not super hot. My Sony XD cam that records on professional disc is probably the best camera that I have as far as early HD goes, and it shoots 1440 by 1080. That was the only thing I was able to get that was HD and pro grade uh, that was under $1,000. And I don't even know why that one was so cheap. Every other camera I've seen that was even vaguely HD has been upwards of a thousand, usually upwards of 3000. So they don't really depreciate as much as one would hope. And part of that is because 4K has not really replaced HD. Um, as far as I know, almost all American television broadcasts are still in 1080i. So I don't really think they're gonna go away for quite some time. Unless we upgraded ATSC for 4K, I think that most programs are still gonna be in HD for the foreseeable future. So, so unfortunately, I think that gear going all the way back to like 2008 is probably just gonna stay expensive basically forever. There's also the problem that frankly, I think a lot of it just looks bad. I mean, even the HD cameras I have, um, like the XD cam or the uh, Sony uh, HD DV cam that I've got that I don't think I've shown in a video yet, the quality of the picture just isn't all that hot. And my last video about the Holly wheel mouse, I did a second angle for the whole thing using the uh, Sony HDV cam and I watched it afterwards. It was just crap. It did not look very good. Jake Laird asks, uh, what are your top five beige whale items? I have no idea that I have millions. What led you to start your camera collection? Um, no, you have other hardware and gadgets, but it seems cameras and camcorders have a special place. I don't know why, but I've been obsessed with video my entire life. Um, I actually, 
I dabble in many things, but I'm just really interested in television. I think not so much because of anything about video itself, but because I'm fascinated about the idea of public performance. I mean, I'm here doing this because I want to be on TV. This question comes up a couple other ways in this Q&A, not surprisingly. Adenode asks, how would you rank the four Neil Sisteriga mouth albums? From best to worst, I think it's mouth moods, mouth silence, mouth sounds, and then mouth dreams, uh, with my ranking being based on whether it's listenable. I think that Mouth Moods is an album of great songs that I just love to listen to, not because they're funny, not because they're uh, quirky, you know, it's, it's not because it's a meme, but because these are like beloved pieces of pop culture, songs that we liked already uh, that have been turned around and twisted and turned into something unique and enjoyable on its own merits, like their their own songs. And I think that's the one of his albums that has the most listenable music on it. I've played that one dozens and dozens of times. Mouth Dreams, I couldn't really get into at all. He has some good ideas on there, but they're mostly ha-ha and, and very little that I actually want to listen to in the car, you know? They also asked, does the less expensive format usually win a format war? This question was also asked a couple different ways. I have absolutely no idea. I don't really have a good head for how much things cost. Randolph Pico asks, in your videos, I've heard you say both my boyfriend and my girlfriend. I was wondering if you had any pride flag colors you'd like to share. Uh, quite a few of them. I'm various types of queer. I don't want to get into it too deep. I used to have a boyfriend. I currently have a girlfriend. In the future, I may have another boyfriend or another girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> Not saying we're going to break up, just, you know, Polly is cool. Also, trans rights are human rights. Zach Stoltenberg asks, a brief overview of your tech career slash jobs throughout the years. I don't want to go into too much detail just because I don't want to fully dox myself here because a number of them were fairly unique. I've worked at two electronic surplus stores. I worked once in electronics manufacturing, uh, actually like stuffing boards and soldering stuff. Uh, and then I had a job in uh, networking. Most of what I know that's relevant to what I do on this channel is not really from my career. RK Storm asks, a lot of your old kit was worth big bucks back in the day. What's the most valuable, rarest bit of old tech you own? I don't really know. Again, I'm not great with the dollar value of things. Most of the stuff I have is not really worth much anymore, frankly. Like, more often than not, I don't have stuff that's still worth a lot. It usually tops out at like three to $500 tops, which might seem like a lot of money, but like, I, I don't know. I mean, you pay $300 for like a standard definition pro camera from 2006 at this point. It really doesn't amount to all that much. I don't have anything that's like, oh, it's still worth 3000 bucks or it's still worth 12000 bucks or whatever. It's all pretty much below the 1K mark. And so it all just sort of blurs together for me, given that I don't really intend to sell very much of it, if any at all. Bruno Fernandez asks, are you neurodivergent in any way? I don't want to go into that too deep, but I would say the short answer is yes. Mike Yoey asks, how has thrifting for you changed over time? Did you used to find better stuff? Do you find better stuff now? Are there any trends you've noticed over time? So in the last few years, the thrifting economy, the secondary market has cratered, at least where I live. In the whole PNW, in um, the Seattle area uh, and down in Portland, uh, it's just been terrible. Like stuff that used to be available as an assumption is just gone. This got really bad after COVID, um, just like everything, right? You used to be able to walk into the Dearborn Goodwill in Seattle and find a whole like half aisle of digital point and shoot cameras hanging up there for like 10 bucks a piece. Uh, I always used to find like Mavicas and stuff there. It was super cool. Obliterated, just completely obliterated. Um, when I go in there now, I'll see like two awful old Kodak Easy Shares and almost nothing else. And the whole rest of the store is kind of like that. There used to be, uh, you know, weird record players. You know, you'd go in there and find like a linear tracking turntable, or you'd find uh, like a weird early CD players, tape decks, stuff like that. All gone. All gone. All the AV gear has been cut down to like cheap VHS decks and. Uh, completely just Garbo DVD players, um, the occasional Blu-ray. They do have TVs, which they never used to have. Like, that's a thing um, that was, wasn't was there for a really long time. Uh, I actually saw a digital SLR in there some months ago, but only the one time, and I haven't seen one since. Most of the speakers that are there at all the Goodwills around here have punched cones. Very few CRTs. Very, very, very few. It's really a bummer. Almost everything interesting is gone these days, in my experience. That's kind of the short of it. Like occasionally I'll see something show up there that I didn't used to, but mostly it's just the same old stuff, just way less of it and way less interesting. Justin Burt asks, would you consider a Patreon tier where patrons tell you their favorite old video games and you stream trying them? You know, I don't really have like a big video game persona going on here and I don't really necessarily want to like super pivot to that. 
Um, I do play video games on my streams because it seems much more appropriate uh, than most of the other stuff <laughs> that I do uh, to a stream format. And also because I almost never play games. Uh, so in order to get myself to do it, I kind of have to do it in front of an audience. Hey, silly, but it is what it is. So I don't know if I would do that, especially because then that would commit me to playing a game, which sometimes is going to be much more of an investment of time than I'd like. That said, people have made some wild suggestions for Patreon tiers and said, like, you should have a $300 tier where somebody gets to just, like, dictate a video topic. And I'm like, I don't want to be held to that requirement, right? Like, to that commitment. What if it's a topic I don't care about? And then they were like, well, it's $300 a month. How many people are there going to be? And I'm like... Okay, okay uh, well, me. Matthew Renfro asks, any ideas or speculation on near future tech? Where do you want to see video audio products coming or going to in the next five to 15 years? I have a very specific answer about this. Back in like 1996, a guy named Philip Greenspan started a website called photo.net. Uh, it's where I got my start doing photography. He had a lot of editorials on there, him just sort of asserting things that I didn't necessarily agree with then or now. But one of the most interesting things on there, which I can't find anymore, he asserted that someday there wouldn't be any still cameras, that there would just be video cameras, people would take video footage, and then later they would pick out interesting stills. That's happened. I mean, the camera that I'm shooting with right now, which I'll show you later, it's basically like a digital SLR running in video mode, but like taking a full resolution picture for every frame, 60 times a second. And I have often taken snapshots from my video and uh, actually uploaded them to uh, Wikimedia so that I can put them in a, in a wiki page. If you go look up like thermal printer, for instance, there's a frame from one of my videos in there. The quality is so good that you can actually sort of do this now. Of course, you've got rolling shutter artifacts and you still have motion blur and things like that. So I kind of think that 15 years from now, we might have cameras that are like 32K resolution and shoot at like 4,000 FPS and then synthesize appropriate blur in, in software, like in post, which means that you'll be able to take any frame from an image, remove all the motion blur, remove the depth of field artifacts, and just get a perfectly crisp image, which you can then you know print and show at a gallery if you want. And I hope that's what happens because that would be super cool. Jacob Alexander Tice says, I've read your blog and appreciate the OS2 guide in particular. Do you plan on doing a video about that train wreck? Oh boy. Here's a short clip of what that video might look like. In the previous episode, I showed you OS2's larval state, and we saw the slow and pathetic growth of its basic limbic system. Today, we will see it enter the world on its own two feet, the product of a rapid evolution. This will take much longer. The fourth version of OS2, version 2 from 1992, is in my opinion the earliest version that made sense to install on your computer. OS2's interface may appear confusing at first glance. However, this is only because it operates on a level far above contemporary or even modern operating systems. For instance, while the default icon arrangement in a window is a jumbled mess of disorganized garbage, you can at least quickly arrange it, not that it makes it a whole lot better. Fortunately, it doesn't end there. You could also undo the arrange, which was apparently worth an entire extra context menu option that's always there. Or you can arrange by a dizzying variety of methods, including from top, or from left, or from bottom, or this little number that I know everyone wishes they could do on Windows 10. I've tried to write a script about OS2 at least four separate times, starting from scratch, and every time I run into the same problem, I just get bogged down because every part of the OS is so ridiculous, and they're all tied together that you can't really focus on anything. You can't explain anything without explaining everything else. Not to mention that many of the problems in OS2 are sort of informed by its historical context. I don't forgive them for that, but both A, it's hard to explain that, hey, Yes, this is stupid. This is a terrible solution to this problem, but nobody else had solved this problem before, so they didn't have a model to look at. And then to go on to, but I still think this was a terrible solution and I still think it's worth mocking. That's a really complicated line to walk in a video format. He also said, as a fellow sufferer of ADHD, I understand the pains you experience because of that bastard of a disorder. Yeah, it sucks. I don't love it. Colin Huth says, imagine the growth keeps progressing Boy, that doesn't sound pleasant when you say it like that. Now now that I think about it, that doesn't sound... And a couple of years from now, you've reached several hundred thousand subscribers. What's one thing about your video creations you'd like to be different and one thing you plan to be very intentional about keeping the same? I want it to be bigger. I want to do bigger things. I want to do stuff with a crew. I want to have multiple people involved in a project. I'd like to have people doing the research that I'm not great at. 
um, going out, maybe contacting people, interviewing them, getting primary sources. Um, I would like to do uh, like big multi individual crude shoots uh, where, you know, maybe even like have a steady cam operator sometimes for things, you know, go outside, walk down the street while somebody follows me, that sort of stuff. I would like to do much more serious involved productions because I love making television as it were. It just would require a much larger income. What I want to keep the same is much simpler. Call me pretentious, but authenticity. I don't ever want to do a video about anything I don't personally care about. Nothing I've done so far is something that didn't get me fired up in some way. Stumble asks, do you have a personal favorite tech slash retro tech content creator on YouTube? I mean, I've watched Techmo and I've watched Technology Connections, LGR, um, a bunch of other well-known names and less well-known ones. Uh, but just from time to time, uh, I guess the problem is with stuff that's in my wheelhouse, stuff that, that's like my area of interest, I have a tough time watching somebody else talk about it because it's sort of like watching somebody else work the computer doing a thing that you know how to do and you're sitting there just like, Give, uh, let me use the... I, no, you didn't. You should have clicked on that. These folks are really talented. They've got their own presentation styles. Um, they're doing great work and my brain wants to be in charge of the ship. Uh, so... <laughs> I think that's actually part of why I started making my own YouTube videos because I want the information about this stuff to be delivered in this very specific sequence. And if I do it myself, then A, <laughs> the stuff I want to see covered gets covered the way I want to see it covered. But also for other people who might be the same way that I am, whatever that is, then presumably it works better for them. And that must be the case because a lot of people seem to like the specific way I'm doing things. Maybe, maybe that's it. I don't know. This may seem completely out of character, but the tech YouTuber I watch the most is actually Linus Tech Tips. Uh, I know there's a lot of people out there uh, who consider themselves high power nerds and think that guy is kind of illegitimate, but I think his stuff is just fine. It's just so completely out of my wheelhouse. It's in another galaxy, right? I think that's why I like it, in fact, because instead of going like, let's deep dive this piece of electronics and see exactly how it works, and let's talk about its, its like historical and cultural context and whatnot and just tear it to pieces, it's just very surface level. Yeah, he goes in and does tests and benchmarks and whatnot, but it's just like, here's a thing, what is the thing? Okay, you can buy it or not, and it's not meant to be an insult. It's a different way of doing things that makes a lot more sense for current products, and so it's a lot easier for me to engage with that sort of stuff. Starlight asks, favorite dinosaur? Velociraptors before we realized they had feathers. Scott Legg asks, thoughts on the Apple II? Are you old enough to have used one in elementary school? Uh, so I shouldn't be old enough <laughs> to remember one, but my school was underfunded. We had Apple IIe's in each classroom, and our computer lab was actually a bunch of Apple II GSs. So we had um, we had the graphical environment on there. I can't remember what they called it. Uh, we had the little mice in the holsters on the side of all the monitors. And I used to think that those things were common. And I didn't realize till later that they weren't all that common. They're not rare. You can get one if you want for a couple hundred bucks, but they just like weren't nearly as widespread as I thought they were. And when most people thought of an Apple II, they thought of a very different machine than I did. Eli Deaver asks, uh, one horse-sized duck or 50 duck-sized horses? I prefer birds, so I'm going to go with the horse-sized duck. Actual question, book suggestions, uh, something technical or a novel or something. Vertical Run. I can't remember the guy's name. It's like Joseph Gardner or something like that. Great book. It's uh, like a diehard knockoff, but really, really unique. Very special. Uh, check it out. I haven't met very many people who have read it. Tom Buck asks, does any of the old gear you cover have a regular working place in your setup? Cameras, mics, computers, etc. This has been asked a number of different ways, but the short answer is no. Uh, and as far as mics, the only used mic I've ever really come across was a Shure, what is it, uh, Beta 58? Something like that. It's the lollipop mic that they, they use to death in every industry going back like 40, 50 years. Uh, that thing I actually used to use a lot for voiceovers, and it's since been supplanted by this guy. Not to mention I don't do that many voiceovers anymore. Richard Pryor asks, what is a tech trend that you would love to come back and what is a tech trend you're happy to stay in the past? This may seem weird, but I would like to see removable media come back for car stereos. It used to be that you could like fumble around for a CD or a tape or something to stick in the stereo while you were driving without it being that much of a risk. Nowadays, your only option really is to fumble around on your phone or hope that like your, your steering wheel controls or, or, or the touch screen on the dashboard or something has a way to control your music. Oh, I know you shouldn't be messing with your music while driving, but look, if you're going to, would you rather be able to just reach down in the dash and go like, I know I've got a copy of ABBA's Greatest Hits in here and just slam a jam it into the deck, or would you rather be poking around on your phone? 
if you're going to do it, I'd, I'd rather do it the safer way. It's really frustrating to me, always has been frustrating to me, that really the cassette was the last handleable media format for audio. After that, you know, it just went to CDs, which like you can fingerprint them. They got you got to put them in the jewel case and, and all, and like they're really easy to scratch up. They're not really like you can't just beat them up. You can't throw them around, right? And then we got like SD cards, CF cards, and whatnot. But they ended up being like way too small to easily handle, and they're too easy to mess up. And then they ended up being too big in capacity to be worth it for what we really should be able to do, which is to just have a pile of albums or playlists or whatever that you can select by just jamming one into your media player. It doesn't make like economic sense and of course look we're all addicted to having spotify but come on give me like a token i can shove in my stereo that will cause spotify to play a playlist please a tech trend that i'm happy is in the past though man that's tough i don't know a lot a lot of stuff has just gotten better and better i i can't really think of anything offhand other than like things being a lot worse like pc cases being made entirely out of sheet metal that slices your hands up i'm glad that's gone course was that a trend uh lasky labs you asked a bunch of questions i didn't have good answers to uh so the only one i'm going to cover is do you play any instruments no not really i dink around on keyboards joe mormon what is your favorite single memory of old computers electronics av equipment etc where their characteristic colors sounds smells which exemplify it for you i'm going to share two stories uh the first is very early one of my earliest memories i could have been four or five i don't know I'm sitting in my parents' like dining nook and the sun is shining into the windows. My mother is cooking pancakes and I'm playing Scorched Earth on the 386. This has stuck around in my head as just one of the most peaceful memories that I've had my entire life. I've always wanted to go back to it. And I guess this was the first time that I learned that technology could be a relaxing, peaceful experience. The other memory is when I was maybe, I don't know, six or eight, somewhere in there, uh, we went to an air show. And I remember a man in fatigues sitting at a Sun or SGI computer with two monitors. I could swear he had two mice with two cursors, but it was one machine. I don't know. And he had a satellite image on there and he was dragging a box over it and it was making the satellite image bigger so you could see a lot more detail. Even at this age, I considered myself fairly knowledgeable about what computers could do, which of course I wasn't at all. And so seeing all these things I didn't know about was the first time I realized the technology could contain surprises and that I wanted to dig deeper and find out what else I didn't know about, things that had just passed me by that I never would have realized were possible if I hadn't gone looking for them. Okay, I'm afraid I can't pronounce your name, uh, Cyrillic, I'm sorry, um, but overview of the new studio and your camera setup, Okay, let's do that. So here basically is the place, or at least this is the main studio room. Uh, I've got two rooms here, but this is the one where I actually make my videos now. Obviously this is the set, right? I painted this wall the same teal that I used back in my uh, home set in the, the basement where I was making videos that was miserable because it was incredibly small, incredibly cramped, and I was using it to live my whole life in addition to making videos, whereas this, this is just for videos. If you're curious, by the way, that color teal, I got that by going to the Sherwin-Williams website, went to their paint matcher, and I dropped in a screenshot of Windows 95. Literally, it just gave me that color. The sconce, by the way, surprised I haven't received more comments on that. I wanted to take it off the wall. <laughs> I don't love it. Uh, normally, if I was at home, I would have just unscrewed it, taken it down, capped the nuts, capped the hole, and painted over it, right? But then I realized that this is a commercial property. I don't own the building, so, I really need to get an electrician in here to do that. And man, that's logistically just, I hate it. I've never had to do that before. So it's still there. I don't know how long it'll be there, but it's a good illustration because it's about seven, seven and a half feet off the ground, which should make it clear that the ceilings here are like 12 to 14 feet off the ground, which is cool, but it's also kind of difficult because I have no idea how to acoustically treat this room. <laughs> I've put a little bit of foam up, but I have no idea what to do up there. I'm thinking I'm gonna have to hang some uh, cloud panels, basically like rock wool panels hanging in the air, like on chains, but that's really hard to do. It's really expensive and it's gonna get in the way of important stuff in here. There's a, like a huge gas fired heater up here that they would obscure, uh, as well as the lighting and, and the fan. And yeah, so <laughs> I'm not sure what to do. <laughs> So I'm just living with it as is, and hopefully the echo in my last couple of videos hasn't been too bad. Maybe eventually I'll figure out how to solve the problem. This here is the new 
presentation desk, that's what I call it. My old one was literally made of garbage. I had some leftover uh, like oak countertop from Ikea. Not nearly as expensive as it sounds. This stuff was like, it was on triple discount. It was like 30 bucks for a huge slab of it. And I just had some left over from a project. So I cut up a bit of it and nailed it to a table that was made out of some two by fours from something else that I knocked apart and put some spare casters on it. And that was that. I never liked it because the wooden top of it, although it looked all right, it made everything brown. The light reflecting off of it cast this warm color cast on everything. So I always wanted a more neutral colored surface. So I ended up with this. I got this thing for a steal from a local used furniture store. Uh, it was $300. I'm guessing they must've been over a thousand new because it's a motorized sit stand desk. If you're wondering, yes, this is how I did the uh, season three intro with all the TVs rising up in the air. It really didn't like it. I overloaded the heck out of the mechanism. But it goes up super, super high in case I want to do a video where I look like the engineer guy. And it goes down super, super low in case I've been a bad boy and have to sit at the kid's presentation desk. But basically this means that I can either sit or stand as needed throughout a video because sometimes one or the other is more appropriate. You may have noticed this in the uh, video I just did about the uh, the Holly Wheel Mouse, uh, sitting in some scenes and standing in others. I really wanted to do that the whole time that I had the old desk, but it just wasn't practical. This room is the largest single room I've ever had command of in my life. Uh, from the door, which is about where the camera is, to this window is 20 feet, and wall to wall is like 16 feet, something like that. And it's not like working out of a house where you've got all these little partitions in the space. You've got bedrooms, bathrooms, kitchen, uh, pantry, etc. Here, it's just one great big open space I can do whatever I want with. That's terrible for echo, but it does mean I don't have to put away my toys the moment I'm done with them. Back home in the basement studio, I had to break down my lights as soon as I was done shooting, uh, and I couldn't have something like this TV back here that I set up on a tripod so I could do the X300 video something I always wanted to do back home, but I didn't have the room for, because as soon as I was done, where am I gonna put this TV? I don't have room for an extra 42 inch TV. I would have to break it down, find some place to stick it, put a blanket over it, collapse the tripod. Here I just leave it set up. And that way, if I'm doing a video and I think, hey, maybe that would enhance things, I can just drag it over and set it up. I'm ready to go. It is of course not a mansion. Uh, I'm already having issues with space, especially in the other room, which I'll show you in a couple minutes. But the point is, it's enough. It's good enough, it's the bare minimum. It turns out that making television requires a great big open space, who knew? By the way, it being a downtown Seattle building, I of course have a brick wall. Every single one of them is like this. They always leave a brick wall exposed. And it's kind of problematic because how am I gonna acoustically treat it? I'm not sure how to get foam to stick to that. I don't wanna use like construction adhesive and I think it would just fall off anyway. I think what I'm gonna to have to do is just hang a great big curtain from the rafters that I can pull over the wall when I'm shooting a video. And that's probably what I'm gonna to have to do with the rest of this room as well, honestly, because getting foam to go all the way up the walls everywhere is both gonna be really difficult, really expensive, and really unpleasant. By the way, if you're wondering why my blinds look like that, it's because they're broken and they're bolted into a steel I-beam that someone drilled holes in. So to replace them, I have to get like a, what is it, like a 72 inch set of blinds and then drill new holes in a steel I-beam to mount them. You can understand why I have not put that at the top of my to-do list. I still do most of my editing at home, but naturally I needed some kind of workstation here. So I built this PC uh, with the money from my big fundraiser. Thank you so much to the people who contributed to that. That was wild. And I got another one of these sit stand desks. So hopefully I will actually sit and stand. I, I've done a little bit of it, but well, you know how it usually goes. Yeah, it's going about like that. This TV here is actually essential. This is my main program monitor. So the set is behind the camera here and this TV is right in front of me. And uh, basically when I'm making a video, I can look straight over and see exactly what I'm capturing and it's at full fidelity as it were. I used to use one of these as a preview monitor. It's a little uh, like uh, seven inch, I think, uh, port keys. A combination HDMI monitor and remote control. So it actually lets me control all the features on the camera over Bluetooth. I found that having a small monitor very close to me was not nearly as effective as having a big monitor far away from me. So this has ended up being super useful, although 
as you can see, I had to take down a whole bunch of the acoustic foam to put it up, and now this is a reflective surface as well, so like I said, the audio treatment situation in here is rough. This down here is my network rack of sorts. I'm probably gonna replace that with an actual network rack at some point so I can put some interesting gear in there. Uh, but for the moment, it's just the internet connection and, and related hardware and it's just sort of piled down there. You know how it goes. This here is actually kind of fun. You know how when you go to a hardware store, they'll often have all these little drawers for like a quarter inch by three quarter inch stainless steel carriage bolts round head, right? A friend of mine works at a hardware store that was getting rid of a bunch of those and uh, they were just throwing them away. So they invited me to come take some uh, they'll mount to the wall, and I have a bunch I'm probably going to do that with. But this one was on casters already, and they're all screwed together. So I just bought it to use as a sort of rolling toolbox. You know, it's got, uh, here's my memory cards. Uh, I've got USB cables there, coax couplers and adapters there, and so on and so forth. Also, I put a 24-inch monitor up here when I'm recording a video, and I connect a Chromecast to it and screencast from my phone so I can scroll through the script at my own pace. It's sort of like a teleprompter, but really bad. This is another thing I just didn't have the room for at home. Uh, this TV cart that I used in the uh, season three teaser. Uh, this is a Sony SSM, so it's not really quite appropriate. I'm planning on getting a more conventional consumer type TV to put up here, but I'm hoping that in context where it's appropriate, like if I happen to be hooking up some old VCR or something, then maybe this will look a little bit better than just putting it up on a, an LCD or something like that. And again, if I didn't have this space, I would have had to take this thing down to pieces so I could stack it in a corner as a pile of legs and shelves and a Ziploc full of parts. And anytime I went to use it, I would think, oh, that's so much work. I'm not, I'll just do something else. This is the second room here. It's about the same size as the first one, but I just use this for storage and projects. So if you ever wondered, hey, how much crap does this guy have? I've got about this much. I brought all this over from my storage unit. This is 10 years of stuff I've collected, stuff I bought on eBay, stuff people have sent me, and so on and so forth. Now, the trouble with a storage unit, right, is you end up putting stuff in crates, and you stack it up, and then if you want to get something in the back, you go, well, I want that thing. It's in storage. Oh, but I'm going to have to move all the stuff that's in front, so then you don't do it, right? I have found that if there's any impedance to me doing a project, I just don't do the project. So what I've done is I put everything on these rolling carts. Oh, the casters on this one are fighting me. So this cart has my consumer camcorder collection uh, and then some other video production stuff. This one's kind of a mess right now. I got to organize these. These two at least are all pro camcorders. Uh, this one in the back is all pro video production stuff. This one to the right here is all CRTs. And the idea is whatever you want, you just find the right cart, pull it out, and that gives you access to everything without needing to unstack everything. So it's kind of like uh, museum archives, right? Or in the, the back room, they got all those shelves that are shoved together and you slide them to get to the Australopithecus skull fragments. This is that, although of course, I do keep breaking casters and then having crises where I have to like rapidly unload a cart uh, while it's got like a chunk of wood stuck under it to keep it from falling over and all my stuff falling off and getting destroyed. So it's not a perfect solution. I'm hoping with the freedoms afforded me by this place that I'll actually be able to demonstrate a lot more of the things on here and then get rid of them because I'm not actually trying to hoard all this stuff necessarily. A lot of it's just pending making a video and then I plan on shuffling it on to the next person. Here's hoping that works out. This, I realize, just looks like an unholy mess, but much of that is because I haven't gotten shelves up yet. Uh, all this stuff down here is going to go up and be a lot more organized, and a bunch of the stuff over there is as well. This is meant to be the um, R&D division, <laughs> where I can set something up on this workbench here, much like I have right now, just a big mess of PCs and monitors for whatever hardware or software I'm trying to test at the moment, but then I can get up go in the other room where it's not horribly cluttered and shoot a video about whatever I already do have a script developed for. This is going to get a lot nicer once it's more organized, get some outlets put on the wall and stuff like that. Obviously, I still have quite a bit of clutter, but what do you expect from a workshop? Also, if you saw this on the way in, no, I'm not just stacking all my garbage in the corner. <laughs> That's just the usual pile of cardboard shipping boxes that everybody has had in their house for the last two years because they're always too big to fit in the recycle bin. And it's not really part of the studio per se, but I do have a little kitchenette over here. It just has a sink and a cupboard, nothing really fancy. Although I did get this Magic Chef, and let me tell you, I'm tempted to get one of those to put in my home because 
it would get my beers much colder than the refrigerator I have at home. So hopefully it's apparent that I'm not just trying to treat this place as an upgraded storage unit or, you know, my bedroom times two. I'm trying to make it into an actual studio, a place where I can make bigger stuff than what was possible back in the basement. Oh, and uh, since I can't film the camera with itself, let's do that. So this is a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 6K. Now, this is not the Pro version. They make two different variants. There's the normal one, the 6K, and then the 6K Pro. I did not realize when I bought this that the Pro was out. There were some people who said the Pro had problems, but I don't believe that really panned out. And it was only like, I think, $500 more. I really should have gotten one. I really regret it. I've been kicking myself the whole time. I'm probably going to get a Pro eventually uh, and then relegate this one to a second angle camera. Um, the primary thing that makes a difference for me is that the non-pro only has one audio input, uh, whereas the pro has two. Actually, I think, I'm sorry, I think you can actually uh, input a second channel through the uh, three and a half millimeter jack up there, but I just want two XLRs <laughs> with phantom power and everything. Now, there are some other issues with this camera that persist on the pro and, and pretty much all the, the BMPCC cameras. The reason I got the 6K in particular instead of the 4K is... As I recall, I don't think the 4K can take Canon lenses. This is a Canon EF mount uh, lens, and the other ones took, I think, four thirds, and I just felt like that wasn't really my wheelhouse. And also, I think the sensor is larger in this one, and that's why it takes such a big lens. Otherwise, it's very similar to the 4K, and it's not the best video camera in the world. It does at least acknowledge that it's a video camera. <laughs> I mean, it's essentially, it's, it's like a mirrorless. You know, you can see it's got, the, it's got the grip on here as if it were a digital SLR or, or a mirrorless still camera. But unlike those, which pretend to be still cameras, even if the manufacturer knows that they're being used for video almost exclusively, this one acknowledges in several ways that it is actually a video camera. It's got this great big monster screen on the back. You know, you, you never get that on a mirrorless. Uh, and all the controls, although they're not, ideal, they're still more or less optimized for this purpose. I also don't dig the fact that it doesn't have SDI out and that you really have to spend quite a lot of money to get a Blackmagic camera that does have SDI out. HDMI is not ideal and it only outputs HD, not 4K, so I don't super love that. I really wish that I could get full-res video out of this to capture externally or display on a preview monitor and you know, actually see whether I'm hitting focus or not. But hey, for the amount I paid, et cetera, what can you do? I also absolutely detest the power connector. This thing is deeply offensive. And the fact that the only medium that makes sense for it to record on is a raw SSD. So I'm using this USB-C uh, SSD, um, which is so universally used for these things. You can actually buy, this is a little custom mount just for the Samsung T5. It's a really dumb situation. And I've already started having flakiness issues with this cable, which is going to be universal with any USB SSD. It's really dumb. I mean, this thing does actually support both uh, CFast and uh, SD, but they're both unreasonably expensive. It costs way too much. Um, these are like 200 bucks for a two terabyte drive and shooting at 4K, that's what you need. By the way, I'm shooting at 422 ProRes Ultra HD. I've got this sitting on what I think is actually a stills tripod. It's just one that I had from back when I was a still photographer, but um, it's got the fluid head on it. I, I think I was thinking of doing video with my DSLR, and so maybe this is a video tripod. I don't remember. It's not the most convenient thing in the world, but it's lightweight, and I, I already had it. I really need to get a C stand um, with a, a big, you know, overarching arm uh, so I can do uh, downward facing shots. As for the rest of my setup here, um, the lights are all just the Godox SL60W, uh, absolute go-to option for people setting up uh, YouTube studios on the cheap. They're like, I think, 160 bucks. Uh, really can't be beat. They're not the best floods in the world, but for the price, they can't be beat. The tripods are offensive. Uh, the damn things, they all bend like, uh, they bend like Ikea lamps, you know, that Ikea torchier lamp that you have over in the corner that's that's canted over like this. They're all like that out of the box. They're horrible little things. Look at this thing. The whole banana going on. I need proper C stands, but they just cost a lot of money, so I haven't bought them yet. Mic-wise, my normal lapel mic is a sure job that I got 
Did I get this on eBay or I find this at RePC or something? I don't remember. But it's a Shure MX-183, I think. Little condenser mic, and I'm amplifying that actually through uh, this guy here, which is called a FET head. It's not strictly necessary uh, with this guy because it outputs a somewhat amplified signal already, but this guy just increases the gain coming into your camera or, or recorder. Uh, makes it a little easier uh, to get a clean signal in my experience, although I actually got this for use uh, with other mics that actually needed it, needed it. It's just basically a clean 20, 20 dB preamplifier, and if you got it, you might as well use it. The mic I was using for this particular video uh, is <laughs> uh, the new old standby, the Shure SM7B. Every single podcaster in the world has one of these, but you know what? They sound great, so I got one too. I also, this stand, again, just terrible, keeps wanting to fall over, uh, and I got it out of the trash. And of course, I just have an HDMI cable running into this TV here, which I either talked about already earlier or will talk about in a little bit. Also, uh, remembering you plan to use that wacky, totally sane DVD slash H.264 camera for second angle shots. Yeah, I kind of changed my mind on that. The quality isn't what I hoped it was. It just does. You can tell when I'm using it that it's, uh, yeah, I'm not doing it. I'm just going to get myself another Blackmagic camera at some point. They don't cost that much. Congruent says, how did you get started in technology? What was the first piece of technology you used? So... I grew up in a family that was full of nerds. Uh, my mom and dad early adopted all sorts of stuff. We had multiple PCs in the house by the time I had my first memories. So the first piece of technology I remember using was probably like a 286 PC, uh, which I think at that point was already been replaced by a 386. And that was just the one that the kids could use. And then I did actually have an NES and I spent an enormous amount of time on that. Woody2 asks, everybody's got a story on how their screen names came into being. How'd you come up with Gravis slash Cathode Ray Dude? Are you just a hardcore Gravis gamepad lover? Yes. So I will say Gravis is not the name that's on my driver's license. Uh, I think a few people thought that it was. Yes, I was inspired by the Gravis gamepad. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I named myself after a goddamn joystick. The reason that name stuck in my head is because uh, Jazz Jackrabbit, if you looked in like the ordering information in the shareware version, it had these diagrams of a Gravis gamepad, I remember, that were just in like these bright, colorful, it just stuck in my head, like this saturated game controller image, for some reason, just stuck in my head. At the time, I didn't know that it was a, a bad clone of a Super Famicom controller. And truth be told, the Gravis gamepad is not that great a product. I just liked the name. It's also fairly unique. There's really nobody else called this. So Google whack. Cathode Ray Dude, on the other hand, I used to have a really silly YouTube name. It wasn't like offensive or anything. It was just like super dumb. It's the only thing I could think of uh, at the time. And it sucked and I hated it. And then one day I was just, I was literally just sitting at my desk and just came to me. Cathode Ray Dude. Went, Googled it. Nobody else had ever said this on the internet. So divine intervention, right? Had to do it. Faison Lord Leet says, if you could choose one of the losers of any format war to be the winner, which one would it be and why? So for the most part, I feel like most formats that have won have been the superior ones. Uh, Blu-ray, for all its DRM issues, eh, it sucks. That's only on commercial movies. If you use it yourself, it's a perfectly viable format. HD DVD was worse in most regards. I mean, the fact we got a format that could store more is a good thing. So as far as a format I wish had won, uh, I think Compact Flash or, or even PCMCIA, just because for the reasons I mentioned earlier, uh, Flash Media is so hard to handle. It's so small. Like I think SD cards are too small. Micro SD is a different story because it gets used in stuff that's really tiny where you couldn't put an SD card slot in there. But almost every time that I have seen an SD card slot on something, there was enough room that they could have just used CF. Uh, there's debate on whether it's actually a better format, but I, I just think a bigger format would be better. Also, where's your interest in early UK micros like the ZX Spectrum comes from, and do you wish to acquire other ones like something from Acorn or Amstrad? I actually do have a couple others. Um, I don't have an Acorn. I want an Acorn um, in Archimedes, and I'd also like a BBC uh, Master. Really cool machines, both of them. Don't have much experience with them other than in emulators. Just great machines that I would like to have, although I'm not sure I would do that much with them. As far as the Amstrad, I actually have a CPC-464. I've just never really had a reason uh, to use it on the channel yet, I think. Um, the reality of uh, playing with 8-bit uh, micros is really miserable because you're loading everything from tape. I really prefer to do everything in emulation. So although I actually have a ZX Spectrum, an Amstrad CPC, a C64, Atari ST, an Atari 800, and uh, several MSXs, uh, I don't really use them all, all that much. They sit in boxes because I found out after I got them just how frustrating they were. But as for why I'm interested in them, well... 
I learned about pretty much every 8-bit machine, you know, when I was like 14 or 15 or something, just reading online, uh, because I was just devouring any information about anything that was different from what I knew. And I learned about these machines. And of course, I was fascinated with them at first, just because they were different, right? Uh, same as with the C64 and, and, and Apple II and, and everything else. Anything I hadn't seen, I was interested in. I actually lost interest in these machines for a long time, because once I got emulators, and then, well, in fact, once I got the real machines, I started playing all the games for them and just decided, you know what, these are crap. They're, they're not very good. They could have been much better. They're all bargain basement garbage. Um, and I just forgot about it for a really long time. And then a couple of years ago, I convinced myself uh, just out of the blue, really, that I was being unreasonably harsh and that I should give them another shot and put myself in the shoes of the people who were actually playing these games when they were new, who weren't, you know, completely tainted by the type of games that were on the NES and Genesis and whatnot. Uh, and I, I ended up having a really good time and I'm still having a good time exploring the games for the ZX Spectrum in particular having a lot of new experiences and uh, types of gameplay, uh, game style that I've never seen before. So it's been sort of a journey for me. Div Zero asks, what song or album have you not been able to stop listening to recently? Uh, man, <laughs> I kind of always have a song or album that I can't stop listening to. Um, at the moment, I just discovered the song by Ockerville River, um, Lost Coastlines. Man, that's a banger. In your ideal alternate universe, who wins the personal computer war? Probably Acorn. Patrick Jasinski asks, how did you do those how the TV signals work uh, graphics in the NES TV video? How long did that take you? I did them all in Adobe After Effects. I had to learn how to write formulas to draw the sine waves and then add them together and whatnot. And I'm very bad at math, uh, but I just sort of got the concepts. I just sort of banged away at it for a while. So I figured out how to dynamically generate those waveforms. Uh, and it took me probably two days to get that rendered because After Effects is a horrible piece of sh Alan Yorty and Andrea x 1308 l ask the related questions. I'm curious what has driven you all this time to collect these things and display them to us. That is an interesting question. That gets into like some deep anthropological questions. Why do we show each other things? Why do I go, hey, check this out. This thing is neat. What's well, a mix of things, right? Um, Self-validation, right? If I like something and I go show it to you and you like it too, then my interest in it is validated. So I must have made the right choice. Also, just the general personal validation of being the center of attention, which I used to struggle to do at all times despite having nothing to add. So people used to find me really annoying. Now that I seem to have something to contribute, it's very satisfying to be the center of attention for what appears to be a legitimate reason. And of course, somewhere way down the list, I want to help. I want people to see things they otherwise wouldn't see. I don't want things to be forgotten. Uh, I want people to better understand stuff that they maybe always wondered about. But of course, those are all things you say. <laughs> I think you work your way back to those sort of justifications. I started doing this because I wanted people to tell me I was good at something. Userjack6880 asks, what is one tech genre you wish you had interest in but haven't had the will or time to explore? Oh man, countless. I mean, the whole field of audio, for instance, uh, would require just sort of starting out from scratch. Um, kind of everything, a lot of stuff, uh, virtually any field of technology, kind of any field of interest, really, I would like to be interested in. Um, and I've just had to stop myself from constantly picking up new hobbies because I can either stick to my core competencies and get better at them, or I can keep diversifying and diversifying until I'm spread too thin to be any good at anything at all. Callan Christensen wants to know if any of my wild speculations turned out to be exactly correct and which ones. Um... Unfortunately, I don't have hard answers right now. Um, it has certainly happened. One of the fun things about doing these videos is that much of the time when I say, oh, this must have happened, like I take the puzzle pieces and assemble them into a narrative and say, I'm sure that narrative occurred, I usually have people responding saying, yes, that narrative occurred. When I made the video about the Holly Mouse, uh, I said, I'm sure there's a bunch of people out there who swear by these things. Yes, those people responded. And I said, I'm sure there were a bunch of people back when these were new who used them and noticed that they skid on surfaces that ball mice don't. And a bunch of people replied and said yes. I've also had a couple emails from people that I can't go into deeply that have just basically confirmed that yes, my speculations about things were correct. I also do get comments from people saying that my speculations were explicitly wrong. Less often, but it does happen. They also asked, have any people that worked on developing or selling a product you reviewed ever reached out to you? Yes, and that has been fascinating. I think two or three times this has happened. I can't talk about it because, you know, privacy issues, you know, people still working in the industry, that sort of thing. But yes, I have had people email me and say, wow, you were the first person I have ever seen acknowledge this thing that I worked on that I thought nobody knew existed. In one case, again, no details, but uh, it was actually a product that was pulled from the market and I have the only one that is still in the wild, just 
remarkable. Jacob Peterson asks, do you remember the first computer you built yourself? That was actually like six years ago. I built an i5 7th gen or something like that. It was the first computer I'd built myself from scratch. See, I've never owned a pre-built computer in my life, but all the computers I've ever owned before that point were cobbled together. You know, it was just sort of a rolling, uh, you know, at any given moment, I've got a motherboard and I, I swap the CPU and I swap the case and then I swap the hard drives. And it, I've just sort of had a continuous ship of Theseus uh, since, I, I don't know, like 2005, something like that. And before that, you know, all my computers were hand-me-downs. I got whatever my brother was getting rid of. So yeah, the first computer I built myself was in like, I don't know, 2017 or something like that. Metabolus asks, do you have any dream collabs with other content creators? Um, man, that's interesting. Like, I would love to do that. Just, just you know, participate in a larger way in this sort of uh, sphere here, this scene. Uh, but I can't name anything in particular. No specific dreams, uh, unfortunately. I don't know what I could bring to somebody else's table or what they could bring to mine, but if somebody wants to hit me up and do something together, I would love to do it. Walt Rimmer asks a loaded question. What would you consider an overrated collector's tech? What's something people have nostalgia for or it's popular to collect that you just don't get or think it's overrated? Well, Max and nearly all Unix machines. Let me explain. I used to be into these super hard um, from an early age. I was fascinated by the Macintosh at a distance. I'd, I'd only ever seen one in person once. It was so different from anything that I knew. Uh, and then uh, I found them fascinating for much of the same reasons that everybody else did. And then eventually I learned about Unix machines, you know, Suns, SGIs, and, and stranger things than that. Uh, and I became fascinated by those, again, because they looked to be different from anything I'd ever seen before. And then eventually I got emulators for some of these systems. And then eventually I got the physical machines themselves. At one point I owned an SGI pizza box and a couple different Macs. And I just kind of woke up one day and went, I don't like any of this. I mean, I'm not saying I don't get it, right? And I'm not saying like, Ugh, you just haven't woken up yet to the fact that these machines are actually not fun. Stop having fun. But at the same time, there's so little to do on a Macintosh. I mean, unless you can really enjoy just the pure aesthetic of the thing, just interacting with it for its own sake, they have so little software available for them that after just like a couple months of owning one, you've pretty much had every experience you're going to have on it. I mean, that's after you've like gotten a hold of like some hardware peripherals or gotten the thing on the internet or, or whatever. There's so little available for them really in the way of hardware or software. And what is available is often highly specialized, much like it is for like the Atari ST where like, yeah, there's music software available for it. Okay are you making music on it? Because you could probably just do that on a DAW on your normal PC and do a better job. Most of the software available for the Mac is just like word processors and graphics packages that are all pretty much identical and it's all pure productivity stuff. The games available for old Macs are terrible and usually available in better formats on other systems. And Unix workstations are even worse. If you've got a Sun or an SGI, you've got like three programs for them total that are unique to the system and the rest of it is just bad Linux. If you want the Sun or SGI experience, you can pretty much just install FBWM or something on your Linux machine and you're pretty much there. There's like nothing you can do on there unless you want to run Maya. And again, you could just get a better 3D package if you wanted to make 3D. I'm not bad mouthing anybody for being into these things, but yes, I do absolutely think that there is so little you can do with them, objectively speaking. There are more interesting platforms like the PC. Seriously, go to winworldpc.com and just start flipping through the software there. You'll find hundreds of applications that do stuff you've never heard of. It may not be something you need to do, <laughs> but it's just, I find it interesting to explore what people wanted to do with computers and the, you know, the single purpose tools they created uh, in order to do those things. And all that just isn't available on the Mac. If I don't want to edit a text file or shop some photo or like connect over Telnet to something, then there really isn't much to do. Jeff Johnson asks if I watched Reboot growing up. No, I saw a couple brief clips of it that stuck in my head super hard and then eventually became so vague I couldn't remember them. Chef Jeffrey Excellence asks, do you enjoy documenting and collecting things purely as an activity or is it somewhat compulsive? I would say it is somewhat compulsive. I have a bit of hoarder mentality. Um, it is very tough for me to see a good deal on something or something that I can't, uh, that I know I can't get again, something that's rare or hard to find uh, and to not get that thing. It's tough for me not to do it, even if I have no real use for it. I have plenty of things in this building here that I can't really use for anything. Um, and 
I'm eventually going to have to convince myself to get rid of them because they're not really serving a purpose. Uh, they just, they, they poked a neuron in my head and my brain said, Ooh, interesting. Uh, but it was unwilling to concede that interesting does not necessarily equal useful. Sonic tooth asks, what's your favorite thing about having a YouTube channel and your least favorite thing? My favorite thing is uh, that I get to do what I seem to be good at and other people enjoy it, which is both a <laughs> self-interest thing. You know, it's nice to finally feel like there's something I'm good at because believe me, I, I didn't feel that way for most of my life. Um, but it's also great that I'm bringing joy apparently to a lot of other people's lives. Apparently a lot of people like watching my stuff, find it relaxing, etc. I couldn't ask for a better thing to do with my time. You know, it's why I would like to do this full time because it's the least evil thing I could do uh, for a career. But my least favorite thing about it is wondering if I'm wrong. I do my best to be right. I try to do research within reason and I also uh, excuse myself from some of that necessity, uh, you know, of being perfectly right by saying that, look, this is partially about experience and perspective. And so the facts don't have to be hundred percent right if they're not that crucial. And it still doesn't help when somebody responds and calls me a dumbass, says that I don't know what I'm talking about, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes they're right. And sometimes they're blindingly wrong, but it's my job now to read all those comments and care about them. I can't, I can't just never read the comments because it's my job to read the comments. And I hate when it turns out that I was wrong because I was just wrong in front of 60,000 people. Daniel Morsing asks if there's any recent video gear or technology that has me excited or does the reality of working with it mean the only thing you see are the flaws? There's two different questions there because has me excited and sees the flaws are usually two sides of the purchasing experience. You know, I will say that when I'm going through like modern cameras, flipping through like the B&H photo listings or whatever, you know, trying to find something to purchase, I am going like, oh, look at that. That UI element looks irritating. Oh, that plug is in a bad place. Ah, they use micro HDMI. But I would say I, I do get excited looking at things. If I look at like a, a an Ursa 8K or whatever they've got now, I do, I drool. I, I go like, oh, I want that. John Sazvari asks, what's something you don't understand in great detail that you wish you did? Uh, honestly, math. I wish I knew more about math. I, I didn't even get through like uh, high school algebra. Just terrible at it. I would do so much with math if I knew it. Toast Your Bear asks, if we have old equipment, would you be interested in any of it? Blanket, yes. Uh, if you have anything you're interested in sending to me or or maybe even selling to me, if it's, if it's really something interesting, send me an email. Uh, the worst I'm going to say is, is a polite no. Uh, I have been saying no to more things lately as I've gotten more things. I'm kind of out of space at this point, but there's, there's still lots of stuff out there that I would love to have. Um, especially things that I don't even know exist. Um, there's stuff people offer me once in a while that I've never seen before. Anything you would like to give a new home, send me an email. The worst you're going to get is a polite, apologetic no. Stefan Noick asks, Z80 or 6502? Z80. Arijas asks, how are you? I'm all right. Gluttonous Maximus asks, wild question, but what aspects would you cover if you decided to review a car? I'm convinced your grasp of design logic and user ecosystem can transcend some lack of knowledge over specifics. I actually know quite a bit about cars. I've done a, a fair amount of wrenching. Um, I have a lot of car opinions, <laughs> a little outdated. I, I sort of got out of the game a few years ago, uh, and it's a whole other universe I'd have to recommit myself to if I was really going to get into that. But if I was going to do car reviews, they would all be focused on user interface because the experience of sitting in a modern car and using it is god awful and it just gets worse and worse and worse every year and i would love to do a series where i just review cars that are actually pleasant to use that don't have like awful dashboards that make you feel like you're sitting in some sort of coffin also any failed or forever postponed projects you'd want to share I don't want to share any failed projects because I'm very embarrassed about them, uh, but postponed projects, certainly. I've got stuff that I didn't do because it wouldn't fit in the basement office, and I'm going to be able to do it now that I'm here, so uh, I'm excited to get around to that. One of them is um, many months ago, someone sent me a uh, like a, a 8x8 um, a video switcher, like a, a, a low-end pro video switcher, great big uh, monster uh, like 8U chassis thing with a, a whole custom control rig, uh, and I did a whole like... I had like an hour and a half, like complete exploration of the thing uh, and then scrapped it. It's actually, uh, I've got it. I've got the completed video sitting on my channel somewhere and I just disliked the quality of it so much uh, that I never released it. And I really want to do a better job uh, that actually looks the way I wanted it to look instead of being this miserable cramped thing. 
You mentioned that the word just in discussions of repair slash DIY projects can be uninviting to newcomers and maybe means the hands-on experience is more difficult in practice than in theory. Uh, what have you found to be easier and less intimidating in practice than in theory? Everything is hard. It's very difficult to say that something is easy. Um, nothing is easy the first time you do it. If I tell somebody that replacing a wall outlet in their house is, is actually really easy and, and shouldn't be intimidating at all, well, yes, they've done the constituent parts of it. Maybe they've, they've taken screws out before, but if you haven't done that specific thing before, then no, it actually isn't easy. It's not easy to not die. You, you in fact, have to do that perfectly. If you don't 100% your first attempt at replacing a wall outlet, they're probably going to be burying you the next day. And even if something isn't lethal to mess up, it's still incredibly discouraging when you fail to do something that you have been assured is actually very easy. So I feel that you shouldn't introduce anything to someone by saying that it's easy. You can say that you're sure they can do it. And you can tell someone that something is hard and that they should be wary of attempting it if it is, for instance, dangerous or if they're extremely likely to fail and to feel terrible about it. But I think you have to be super, super careful about ever saying that something is easy. I'm not sure I ever say that anything is easy, and if I do, I shouldn't. Mason asks, have you ever accidentally broke something you were working on trying to get it functional? Absolutely. More times than I would like to admit. Stian Nobilisto asks, have you ever shot on 35mm or 16mm? Do you have any interest in shooting film at all? When I first read this question, I thought you meant stills for a second, but I'm sure since he said 16mm, you probably mean movie film. I actually did shoot on 35mm still film for about a decade. Had a pretty good time with it. As far as movie film, no, never done it. Not sure that I could. I mess things up so often and so much that I don't think I could deal uh, financially or like emotionally with burning $15,000 of film and processing uh, only to find out I made an, a minor error and I'm going to have to do it again. Because usually on my second try, I just screw up a different thing than my first try and now $20,000 of film is in the trash. Alpunk says digital tape still has some applications for system backup and stuff like that in the current day. Uh, do you think there'll still be room in the market for a similar home format for media preservation? People don't care about backups. People don't care about anything when it comes to preserving their memories, etc. Everything is ephemeral. People take pictures and then they just sort of forget about them. Like, oh, it's, I don't know, it's on my phone. It's in iCloud. It's on a hard drive. I, I don't know. It'll, it'll be there if I want it. And of course, that's not true. Everything that's on a computer, everything in a digital format degrades. It, it's all falling apart. It's, it's all rotting. And you have to actively keep stuff alive. Yes, maybe it'll survive for a long time on an SD card, or it won't. Or you'll lose that SD card, which is a lot easier than losing a box of photos. Or it'll get you know static shocked, or, or it'll get like a cosmic ray, or it'll get plugged into a computer that wipes it because it's got a virus on it, or who knows what. And nobody cares. Nobody is fired up about this. The overwhelming majority of the general public does not care. They don't even realize that in 15 years, 95% of their memories will only be memories. We are living in an informational dark age. In 30 to 50 years, virtually everything that is known about this era of the human experience will be gone. There are no hard copies of anything. Nobody cares. Nobody's going to care. And I have given up on making them care. It's just an apocalypse that I'm waiting to play out. Alex Whitland asks, since you never worked in television, what sparked your interest in analog cameras? I have no idea. I've just always been fascinated with them. I cannot remember a time when camcorders did not deeply intrigue me. Nick 24 asks, favorite aspect ratio? I've been watching movies on my 21.9 ultra wide a lot lately, and man, I really enjoy it. I actually don't like movie theaters very much. I've only been to them a couple times. It's just not my thing. I've always just watched movies on uh, my on my PC, on my monitor. And the wider the screen is, the more fun it's been. But 21.9 is about what I realized I want. I really enjoy the immersion of watching a movie that way. Uh, same for video games. That's been really enjoyable. As far as producing video stuff like this, I think 16.9 is actually really appropriate to pretty much everything we do. 4.3 just didn't cut it. I didn't like 4.3 when I'd never seen 16.9. I always wanted it to be wider. Um, but I think that going all the way to 21.9 requires too much traversal of the eyes um, for didactic information. So if you're doing something that's purely informational and not uh, heavy narrative, then I think that 16.9 really is the sweet spot. They also asked, any opinions on the noise reduction in the new Beatles Get Back documentary? 
I haven't seen it. I never heard about this before I read this comment here. I'm going to guess that it's one of those AI upscaling slash noise reduction things. And my firm answer is no, bad, bad dog. Stop it. All that AI upscaling and cleanup nonsense is going to be remembered 20 years from now, the same way we remember lobotomies in the fifties or those ridiculous like hyper HDR photo stack ups people were doing in like 2009. It's going to be regarded as just quackery, this, this completely utter lunacy that we should have realized was lunacy at the time. And before anybody could be stopped, just enormous swaths of damage were done. There's going to be so many like Star Wars special editions, just movies that used to look pretty good, but they've been ruined by all this enhancement nonsense that like nobody is actually watching. All this stuff is being run blindly. Nobody is checking to see if it's actually doing a good job and the results are just catastrophic and I weep for the future of media preservation. Tiny Finger Dildos, who is a friend of mine, asks, now that Shadow Warrior is dead and gone, are you going to tackle the later Myst games? If you don't know this, which you probably don't, I played through a good chunk of Shadow Warrior on my second channel on a stream uh, several weeks ago, and that game is terrible and really racist. It was so racist that magazines at the time were like uncomfortable about it. They were like, yeah, this game's pretty good, but um, it's got a lot of racism in it. As far as the later Myst games, uh, I have tried to play those several times. I bounce off of them like rubber. They are terrible. Postal UT asks, have you ever considered a segment where instead of reviewing odd formats of the past, you do a roundup of currently available formats or products that will soon be forgotten by history? I don't know if I'm really hooked into the present day well enough to do that. I'm like, I've thought it over and I can't really name anything that I would cover in that sort of thing. So there's probably somebody who would be good at it. And it's an interesting idea. I'll think about it because that maybe there's something there. Um, but I don't really think it's for me. Emmer and Folsom asks a question too big to answer right now. Let me do these other ones first. Ekino Idea asks, what piece of current technology from the past decade or so do you think will be most desirable to future vintage electronics collectors? Wow, um, that's interesting. That's another thing where I don't think I think about current technology enough to answer it effectively. But the, the problem is that a tremendous amount of stuff from the last decade or so is going to turn into a pumpkin if it hasn't already, right? So uh, imagine if like, in an alternate universe, somebody in uh, 2045 is going, hey, man, check it out. I got a Nest camera. Wow, they had these back in, in, in 2019. They were blah, 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 blah. Well, no one's going to do that because it's just going to be a lump. It's going to be a lump of plastic that doesn't do anything, right? You can't collect a cloud service that's now gone. So there's so much stuff. Uh, cell phones, um, smartphones that are largely dependent on app stores that will be gone in 10 years, um, certainly be gone in 30. All sorts of other gadgets. Um, you know, I, I guess PCs might be one of the most collectible things in the future because cameras probably aren't going to change all that much. Audio gear isn't going to change all that much. It's all just software now anyway. The only thing I can really think of that isn't some device that's useless without a, a clown service hosted down in San Jose uh, is the PC, right? Because they're still basically what they always were, but they, they keep improving them. So in 30 years, uh, will somebody be excited? To, oh, somebody will be excited to collect uh, a 12th gen i7, right? They're going to either be saying, Saying, oh man, this was the first Intel chip that works the way they all do now. Or they'll be saying, this was Intel's ridiculous failed flop idea that they made up to try and catch up with AMD that totally backfired on them. I'm betting on the second one. All caps asks, what's the one that got away? There are millions. Gaming psychologist asks, do you ever play tabletop games? Uh, if so, which ones? Uh, I used to play quite a few um, I, uh, back when I saw friends in person. Um, I've become kind of a hermit, not just because of COVID, but uh, even before that, just some stuff happened in my life. And, and I just sort of, ha I have a hard time going and spending time with people uh, these days. But I used to play a lot of uh, card games, uh, not, not just like uh, CCGs, um, but also just like sort of card-based uh, tabletop board games. I enjoyed those. I don't know, something about cards I like. Uh, and I'm actually... Uh, still playing a D and D session that I've been, had going weekly for about four years. Uh, D and D is pretty cool. Tabletop games are pretty cool. Doc Drazen says, "I know I've seen Gunpla in some of your videos before. Any favorite kits or thoughts on the hobby?" I only got into it briefly. My girlfriend was way more into it than I am. Um, I think it's a super cool hobby. It just was another thing that I I thought I could pick up and realized I didn't have the time for. It's a triumph of plastic injection molding technology. Really, really cool that they can make those things at all. I'm, I'm just stunned at the microengineering that goes into them. 
Bennett Kenyon asks if I use any of the camcorders I show off for their intended purposes, professional equipment as well, sort of redundant, except uh, it reminds me that I do use the uh, data video Firewire DAC to capture analog video. Niall Fleming asks, are you always grumpy about every product you review or is it just that you like to be thorough? I feel like you just hate some things for no good reason. Um, here's my answer. I have not hammed up my dislike of anything. It is always a genuine response. I may be a dumbass. I may be somebody with bad opinions. All I can tell you is I look at something, I consider it as, as hard as I can, and if I just come up going, oh, this thing is stupid, then that's what I say. It would be more objective, perhaps, to try and put myself in somebody else's shoes, somebody who appreciates it better, but why is their opinion any less valuable than mine? Oliver Garrett asks, is there any piece of old tech that's become a staple of everyday life for you? For instance, I do a lot of gaming on an old Microsoft trackball. Not really anymore. I used to have a couple of Apple extended keyboard twos that I used over an ADB to USB converter, uh, both at work and at home as my daily drivers uh, for several years. I really liked them, but then mechanical keyboards became widely available. You can get them for a song now, and I ended up finding new models that I actually enjoyed more than that one. So hasn't really been a thing in my life for a while. Ben Render asks, what's my hit it big win lotto dream car and what's your favorite meal? Uh, my favorite meal might be a King Arthur Supreme from Round Table. That is a perfect pizza. Dream car, you know, I, I can't name one offhand. Cars are mostly utility for me. Um, you know, I'm not much of a, a go fast, turn left and right kind of person. Rivia one asks if I'm going to bring back the LGBT tape and the other inclusive nods on my new set. Yes. Uh, this set is actually nowhere close to done. Um, there's supposed to be a whole bunch of stuff back here. I was thinking of getting some, uh, like sturdy bookshelves and putting stuff on them and putting them on wheels so I can line them up along the wall here. So I have a, a sort of a more interesting background, but I can roll them out of the way to get the solid backdrop, um, for, for all my, my chrome a key shenanigans. Um, I was supposed to do that shortly after I moved in here and things have just been too chaotic. Um, when that happens, I will definitely have uh, all those nods and more back. Jim Leonard asks, do I work with a script or teleprompter or is everything completely off the cuff? These days, almost nothing is off the cuff. I've been using some sort of script almost since I started. Um, when I do stuff off the cuff, I end up saying a lot of dumb stuff uh, that ends up being wrong. So I script everything so I can catch my lies and misinformation before it comes out of my mouth. I don't use a teleprompter, however, and that really sucks. I would love to use a teleprompter. It would make things a lot easier. Uh, I used to think that I didn't work with one, but really, like I've seen a lot of people using teleprompters uh, that seem a lot more like me than, than I would have expected. Uh, so I'm kind of convinced that I really need to get one. The problem is they're incredibly expensive. Um, you can either buy a shitty one that you put an iPad in. No, I want nothing to do with that. No, get that away from me. Don't even talk to me about it. Or you can buy one that is actually like a monitor. You could plug a, a, a computer into to run teleprompter software on. And those are all three to $6,000 minimum. And they require like a, a whole, a whole setup, like a whole rig. I would need a bigger tripod and stuff. And so, it's just quite an investment. If anybody has one of those, they'd like to sell to me for a reasonable price. I'm, I'm talking money here, just less than market. Email me. I really want a teleprompter. I do work off of sort of an ersatz one. Um, I put a big monitor uh, behind the camera and I Chromecast to it from my phone. And so I can scroll through the script. So I'm just sort of glancing up there, reading a bit, then looking at the camera and trying to recite it. But part of the reason I do that, and I don't even know if a teleprompter would work for me, is because... I paraphrase everything that I write. I, I do write the script as carefully as I can, but then if I try and say those words exactly, I'm, I'm never gonna do it. I'm gonna sound like a mannequin if I do that. What comes out of my mouth has to be what's in my head. It's just the way my brain works. So I don't know that I would ever use a teleprompter verbatim, and so maybe this process is as good as it's gonna get anyway, uh, but still, man, I'd love to try a real one. Deborah Pangosh asks, what is the most valuable yet least interesting to me piece of tech I own? What's the most interesting but inexpensive piece of tech I own? I guess the least interesting to me would have been the Amiga 4000 with video toaster uh, that I gave, maybe it was an Amiga 2000 with video toaster, sorry, uh, that I actually just gave to a friend. I can't get into the thing. The video toaster is not that great a piece of equipment and unless you're doing live TV production, there's, there's not much you can do with it. And I actually don't find the Amiga that interesting a machine. So that was the least interesting but most valuable piece of equipment I owned. Most of the stuff I have now just isn't all that valuable. But the most interesting but cheap thing I own, huh, I'm not really sure. I think everything I have is in, in this very specific like two to $500 range. 
Leet Allison asks, what was the first camcorder format that could do 1080p and meet modern fidelity standards? Like if you had to use a vintage camera to make videos for the channel. That's an interesting twist on the question. I don't know the answer to that. Frankly, it was probably like 2012 or something like that. So not really very vintage at all. I think the first camcorder that could record footage that would not look out of place uh, in, in my videos had to have been from the 2010s. It had to have been recording on a solid state medium, uh, in which case it's really just the same thing we have now. Just numbers go up, price goes down. So I don't know if I have a satisfactory answer to that. Vivian asks, do I own the free or paid version of DaVinci Resolve? And what are the advantages of the paid version? So I use the paid version. I started out on the free one and I switched to paid pretty quickly because the free version does not let you see your video in full screen. It's bizarre. Like when you're editing in the free version, you've just got these two panels and your video is over here in this one. And it's like this big, even on a huge monitor, it's only this big. On most monitors, it's gonna be like this big. I can't edit that way and there's no way to get a second preview display. You have to get the paid version to get the second monitor mode. And I don't know if that's a deliberate restriction to force you to get the paid version or if it's because uh, Blackmagic is a weird company. But either way, that's the primary difference. Oh, also the free version does not use GPU accelerated uh, effects, I think. Uh, and that does make a significant difference in performance. I actually benched this recently, but I forgot the results. Truck2224 asks if I've considered making a pirate radio or television station. No, the FCC publishes all the fines that they hand out and they are brutal. Plus it's just not really my thing. Forrest Walker asks, what's the worst video game you love? I actually, I had to think about this for a while. It's Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon. It, that game's not a great game, but man, what a brilliant idea. Just sort of going in on their own game series like that, genius work. If I recall correctly, there's videotapes you can pick up in that game. They're just like collectibles. And your character, when he first picks one up, is like, yeah, I got one of them. You keep picking him up and he keeps saying different things and finally he goes, yeah, I got another one. Why the hell am I doing this? It was hilarious. It was one of the most brilliant things I'd ever heard in a video game. It was fantastic. It was like the Stanley Parable, but better. All right, here's Emerin Folsom's big messy question. You seem to be developing a coherent sort of philosophy of technological history, along with a method of doing technology historiography. It's influencing a lot of my own thinking, if only because you make certain feelings about it susceptible to language, thinking of beige whale, the plateau, etc. Do you consider yourself part of a tradition in thinking about technology history? Who, if anyone, are you reading that shaped your own perspectives on these things? I know you mentioned Tim Hunkin as an influence. So I should mention that I spent most of my life being an irritating little pest. Uh, I used to be insufferable. I had a huge ego and knew very little. I was constantly opining in situations that I knew nothing about. Uh, everyone pretty much found me annoying as hell. I wanted to be the center of attention, but had nothing to offer. Eventually, I realized that I had stuff to offer and I started trying to play to my actual strengths. And this is about the point where people stopped hating me. It's also the point where I stopped showing my entire ass in every single conversation. It was a big improvement in my life. But as a recovering asshole, it's hard for me to say that I'm the new tradition. <laughs> it's tough to say like, excuse me, everyone, I've figured it out. And if you'll all just follow me, I will show you how to think about this. In fact, I would say that all I'm really doing is trying to show you my perspective, which sounds really trite, but let me, let me explain what I mean. I was talking with friends about this earlier, actually, coincidentally. I said earlier that I have a specific process in which I think about things, and that's why I bounce off of a lot of other people's YouTube videos. Well, I enumerated that process. When I discover a new device, a new object, it goes about like this. I discover the thing exists, and I'm confused about either why it exists or how it works. Then I challenge those assumptions. I go try to figure out why it existed, what it does, and how it does it. Once I understand what and how and why it is, then I ask, was it actually what it was supposed to be? Did it satisfy people? Did it do what it was supposed to? Did it succeed or fail? And if so, was that because of its merits or because of external reasons? This sounds straightforward, but I realize that an awful lot of people stop at step two or three because they don't have the domain knowledge or the time or patience uh, to run something to ground. If you want to look at a you know some weird rotary encoder and find out why it is, I've never seen something like that. Why is that thing? You have to first know what a rotary encoder is, and you have to know what avenues to go down to pursue the information about why it's different, and in fact, to find out that it's different at all. 
And so at some point in my life, I realized that people have an awful lot of questions about things, stuff that they've seen and always scratched their heads about, but never really knew how to pursue. That's a lot of what Tim Hunkin does on his program, The Secret Life of Machines. I only saw that show for the first time a couple years ago, but as soon as I saw it, I, I just said, wow, that's it. That's what I want to do. This guy here is a huge nerd, and you know that he has all these friends that were always going like, Tim, I, I, I'm sure that washing machines are fascinating inside, but we're at the pub, man, and we just have a pint. I've been the guy sitting at a restaurant saying to somebody, you won't believe what I learned about portal gears today. But just as often as that's tonally incompatible with the setting, people also go, oh, is that how that worked? I always wondered. And that's what Tim Hunkin was doing on The Secret Life of Machines. He was cutting open washing machines and saying, here's how the water gets in and out, and here's why it thumps when you overload it. Questions that people had, but they weren't sure how to pursue. And he's doing it out of pure enthusiasm. You could tell that when he first learned how a washing machine worked inside, it was just remarkable to him. And that he probably looked at one at some point and said, why does it thump like that? How does the water get in and out? And went and found that answer on his own. If you look around and everyone has the same question and you know you can answer it, then, well, you know you're going to be a little bit of a hero for answering it. So, like I said earlier, I'm doing this because I get to be the center of attention now, for, for good reasons instead of terrible ones. But as for setting a new tradition, I guess what I would say is I think the YouTubers that are doing this already that are very popular are popular because they're doing it the way people want them to do it. But people differ. So, if anything, I would say that I'm trying to fill an unserved niche and perhaps there will be more people in time who do this the way that I'm doing it. That would be pretty cool, but it wasn't my specific intent. That's about my seventh time trying to answer that question. Hopefully that did something for you. So there we go, 85 questions, or more or less, probably less. I probably skipped some. I'm never sure what to do for special events. I've done a few of them so far and, you know, like special extra content for patrons. I never know what to do. And you know, I did one Q&A a while back. It's the only special video I could think of, really, other than the occasional, like, here's stuff that I haven't actually posted on the main channel before. And a Q&A was really the only thing I could think of to do here as well, because virtually everything else would be like, Gravis reacts to playing Minecraft for the first time. There's actually an interesting phenomenon that's been going on for years now. Going back to, I think, my NES as a TV station video, which was pretty much the beginning of my channel in its current form, I've been getting the same comment on every video, usually two or three times. And it goes, great video, I love your work, I can't believe you have so few subscribers, I'm sure you'll have a million by the end of next year. You know, this has been going on for long enough that several of those people are now definitely wrong. I didn't have a million subscribers a year after two years ago. Checkmate. But the reason I don't have a million is probably because I'm not doing much other than just uploading a video every week or two. There's a whole bunch of like in-between stuff that people do to grow their channel and I want nothing to do with it, right? So stuff like this is just super alien to me. I'm not sure what to do outside of what I feel like doing, which is I make a video that says exactly what I want to say and I upload it when it's done. And that's great because it's super weird to look you in the face and go, oh, only 60,000? Mm, I really wanted a quarter million at least by this time. I mean, you're nothing to me and I wish you were even less. That would really be great for my bank account balance. And I mean, it is. Like, I, I did turn on monetization recently and it made a significant difference in my financial situation, which is great because I really desperately want to stop having the job that I have or, or any other job, really. I would like to just do more of this. I would like to do more and better of this as the only thing that I do. It's, and to that end, it would be great if that number would go up faster, but not at the cost of having my comments filled with dumbasses. I'm pretty pleased at this point that I have what seems to be a pretty organic subscriber base. As far as I can tell, almost everyone who subscribed to me did so because they watched one of my videos, liked it, understood what the hell I was talking about, and wanted to see more of the same. I think it's great that most of my comments seem pretty intelligent. A lot of YouTubers don't have that luxury. I appreciate all of you for sticking around, not to mention the folks who were supporting me directly. Here's hoping this all keeps working out for everyone.